Welcome to another episode of Destination Linux Podcast. Welcome to episode 37 of Destination Linux. I'm Rocco, and with me today is Ryan, my partner in crime. And we have some special guests. Who do we have, Ryan? They are indeed special guests. We have two core lead team developers from the Manjaro team, Philip and Bernhard. We are so excited to have you on. Everybody knows how much I love Manjaro and having you guys on uh, this podcast here is just such a privilege. So, Philip, do you want to tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do for Manjaro? Hi, Ryan. Thanks for having me. So I'm the project lead of Manjaro and mostly doing the background uh, installer stuff, ISOs and package management. And also I'm the PR guy of the project. Perfect. And we have with us also Bernhard. Hi, I'm so happy to be with you. <laughs> well, I do uh, lots of, uh, lots of uh, different things in Manjaro. Uh, originally I started as a user. I've come from a completely different area. I'm a, singer and uh, I just got more and more involved into the project because I got so fascinated by it and I started more or less with uh, community editions. I did the i3 spin at one point and then uh, after that somehow this uh, was not enough so I did Fluxbox and then later on the big project was the Deepin edition and also I took over the, the Cinnamon edition. And so, well, I just got more and more involved. I started packaging and uh, also the development, of course, happens in a team of the installer of the uh, the build tools for ISOs and stuff. And also I contribute in different areas, also with theming and uh, all sorts of things. And also lately, uh, biggest project was the architect installer together with Chrysostomus from the forum. And uh, that was really a big project and a huge mountain of work. And that was really fascinating. And I learned quite a lot with this. Clearly, we can see all the work going into Manjaro. Uh, every release that you guys have has uh, had some major improvements and changes. And the popularity of this distribution is absolutely unquestionable. Uh, no matter who you're talking to or when I was doing the 30 Days of Linux Challenge a while ago on my channel, everybody in the comments was like, please try Manjaro, please try Manjaro. Eventually I was like, fine, I'll go try this thing. <laughs> and uh, absolutely fell in love with it and uh, love the improvements you guys are making. You know, you talked about how you got started in Manjaro, but why don't you guys tell us uh, and start with Phil, where did you, what got you into Linux from the start? Well, it was quite different. So I'm more the, the book reader and magazine reader. So I went always to the paper shop and see if there's some issues or something like that. So actually a newspaper or a magazine introduced me to Linux. So for example, this was this one here, that edition. So it's from 20,000. It's a Linux user thingy That's and awesome. it has actually some old stuff there. Then I went on. Then I went to Red Hat. So yeah, those kind of things. Check then out Mandrake. Went wow. to Suze. You kept them all <laughs> in. <How laughs> <cool is that? laughs> then I had Mandrake. Then I was with Red Hat once more. Then with Suze, I was in Linux gaming. Wow. I went over to uh, England and has the Linux format. Wow. Then again, Suzer again and such. And in the end, I was landing with Ubuntu. So, yeah, this was one of the things that I did. 2006, it was Ubuntu time. That's and that so was cool. then when I started. <laughs> wow. I love that you kept that. I mean, that's something you're never going to forget because obviously now it's become this major portion of your life. And uh, you still yeah. have all of those artifacts. So, Bernhard, I really hope you have some visuals to share with us, too. Oh, not at your... all. <laughs> <laughs> not whatsoever. <laughs> and the reason is that I have only started about uh, not even three years ago with Linux. But I was mm -hmm. uh, more or less playing with the idea for a long time. Uh, what kept me back was uh, because I need uh, special 
I need uh, software for sheet music editing. Mm -hmm. And uh, until recently, it was quite difficult to find something really good with Linux. But uh, during the last, I would say, two years or so, de development in Linux has so much exploded. And I mm -hmm. realized that meanwhile, I can do really everything I need to do. And uh, what did, uh, in the end, uh, I've, I had a dual boot for, for a while. So because uh, there were just uh, two or three programs left that I still needed to use in Windows. And then one day I was attempting to install uh, another Fluxbox ISO into virtual machine. And uh, actually I made a mistake because I was doing some other stuff at the same time. And then I, I erased my windows and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> and since then I have never missed it. <laughs> You're not going to go try to find that registration key again. You're just like, I'm no, done. I'm just going to so gone. It. No. Yes. <laughs> All right, so last week we had the exciting news of the announcement of Station X and you guys collaborating for a laptop, but we'll get to that. But let's start out with how did Manjaro come about? So you started, according to your wiki, you started releasing in 2011 and have like 22, this might be the 23rd release so far. So where did Man where did the idea of Manjaro come from? Well, the idea come from, well, I started Linux not with Manjaro. I had some different projects before. One you don't might know is Paldo. Paldo is a Swiss Linux distribution, which had none so ever an installer. So I started with that uh, thing. Back then, I wanted to have GNOME. So GNOME was my uh, favorite desktop back then. So I searched for one, which is the, the baddest uh, distro or not known distro ever. And this was Paldo, which has <laughs> GNOME was also rolling release, and I started joined that project and created an installer for that. After that, I was looking for different desktops, so I was a little bit a distro hopper. Nice. And the next thing <laughs> was uh, KDE. KDE 4 was it in that time, and Arch Linux was great good, but uh, it was not so modular. They had always the packages in one big tarball, and they released it the same. So there was a side project called KDE Mod, and I joined that one. Then again, I was also in involved creating the installer and the ISOs. And based off KDE Mod, we realized that Arch is too fast, too fast spin, and we can't compile our packages against those. If uh, Arch updates something, our KDE Mod packages broke. So we decided, okay, we split from that and uh, create something completely different. So Chakra Linux was born. So <laughs> I s was one of the lead developers of Chakra Linux back then and was leading it for a couple of years until I met Roland. And Roland was the guy who started Mancharo with Glom. And uh, I was not so fit with my team anymore. So I wanted to start something new. So I worked on Manjaro with those two guys for one year in de uh, deep secret. Nobody knew I was one year off the, off the internet yep. and then zero eight comes out. So this was in 2003, something like that. No, 13, not three, 13. Yep. Very yeah. nice. Thinking back on that time when this was first starting out and you're kind of switching teams and doing this, did you ever imagine it would become what it has today? No, it was just a hobby project and now it's realizing, materializing to something bigger. Everybody is using it and we are actually on DistroWatch, one of the top tens last year and this year we never went below five. So whatever is there, if you look at the half year stats, we are pretty good in that case. And uh, our project and how we release as when it's ready or when it's needed as yesterday or not yesterday. Yesterday, I released something for a new project as well. But last week, we had two releases. We had the 1703, which came out uh, some about Monday or something like that. And last Friday, we had to release something else. Bernard actually find something <laughs> which we might have fixed. And Gulam uh, agreed. So even Friday, who is doing our mirror tool, where you can see which is the last mirror, we found some issues and we fixed those. Uh, yeah, I was a Calamaris, our graphical installer got a new release. So I thought, hey, 
what can we do about that? We have the community here and we already saw that uh, that's the last uh, 32 uh, release ever. And when we go out with that architecture, it should be with a bang. So the ISO should be bug free. So we had to release last Friday another one. Right. Beautiful. Well, you offer XFCE, obviously, as the flagship for Manjaro, but you offer KDE, GNOME, and a NET version. And you also have community editions, Cinnamon, i3, uh, Mate, and OpenRC. And you also have derivatives that are made from, made based off of uh, Manjaro, which are Netrunner and Sonar. So your your popularity has grown. So how does that all fit into, like, how do you feel Manjaro differentiates itself from everybody else? Because obviously now, it's a popular distro. <laughs> I would say this huge variety of desktops is one of the biggest strengths of Manjaro. We had lots of discussions about this, actually, because the, often uh, it was the point, well, should we concentrate more on just a few desktops and not... Uh, split up all our resources to too many, too many different ISOs and uh, settings packages and whatnot. And, uh, but uh, just this, uh, this recent uh, bug we found, it shows again how good it is to actually have many different environments because actually we found it in, uh, in the release candidate of Cinnamon edition. And then uh, first we thought it's a Cinnamon issue and then uh, it turned out it was actually something that needed to be fixed in all the editions. So I think it's really, and also what is exciting, I think that with the community editions, there are even a few more than you have mentioned. We also deep in. Yeah, he missed the uh, We have Mati, <laughs> Bachi. We ran out of space on the Bachi. page. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So basically, yeah. Uh, yeah, but also we we like that in the, in the forum. We in the forum we're kind of building up a, a knowledge base also uh, regarding the the environments because you have one uh, maintainer of a, of a community edition, and then uh, you have the, some favorite users of a community edition, and they they come together and they find solutions and they uh, find new ways and uh, tweaks and stuff and. So, for example, i3 is one of the older community editions. And in those, I mean, we have really an extremely polished version of this environment. And uh, I think it's mostly because we have uh, a growing group of, of users for also these editions. And uh, it just it comes together and it grows. And uh, over time, the core desktop stays the same. And then we have additions, we have contributions of scripts and whatever. And... So I think it's really uh, a big plus that we have so many different editions. Of course, it's we're not really a huge team, and uh, yeah, it's sometimes. I mean, we we're, we're all doing this as a hobby, and of course, right. all of us spend a, a lot of a far too much time <laughs> for all this. <laughs> Obviously, yeah. <laughs> because actually, yeah, sometimes. Well, let me it's ask really you because you guys were talking about all the different desktop environments. Which ones are you guys using? Maybe right now. I'm sure you switch back and forth. Which one are you using right now, Bernard? I'm. Uh, I cannot get off i3 somehow. <laughs> I mean, I'm actually at the moment I am also on the Spitfire, and of course I have the XFC edition that we have been preparing and tweaking for many weeks now. But I could not resist to also have install a second user with i3 desktop and I actually I'm on the three i3 three desktop now also it's just so I'm so used to it and I just love it so much it's for me it's uh, the most efficient way to work for me what, what about you Philip you can guess I'm always with a flagship <laughs> nice <laughs> <laughs> You do well, not deviate. I'm, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm using XFCE, actually the upcoming 4.14 version. So it's all the latest uh, Git issue we have here on the Spitfire we're working on because we saw it. When we release, uh, when we release then it uh, has to be with a GDK3 version of XFCE. And it's really running stable as it is now. Well, speaking of the Spitfire, it, th this is one way you guys are really differentiating yourself uh, with the release of it. 
So how did this all come about that you would talk to Eddie over at Station X and just decide, hey, we're going to put a laptop together? Well, every now and then we had uh, requests since uh, the name was really growing. And uh, also, I think the idea of uh, producing Linux laptops uh, and desktop computers was a growing uh, branch. And uh, some of the requests were not really all too serious, I guess. And uh, when we, we started to get into details, it turned out most of the time that this is not really... Uh, there's not enough uh, thinking behind it. Right. But with Eddie, uh, he wrote to us and uh, he was actually, his plan was to, to preload another, uh, another distro. And then maybe he was asking if we would like to uh, theme it a little bit uh, differently or so. And then we discussed it for a while and then we decided, well, if we, want to do this, then uh, it should really be, we should really walk the, the whole mile and uh, uh, really do something that is made for the machine, that not just the theming, but really, I mean, I have uh, de designed so many community editions now, and what uh, used to <laughs> annoy me was always that you you saw that you could do this or you could do that, but then you would always keep in mind that it was it needed to work on any hardware. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, we can really go for it and then tweak it totally to the machine. And uh, it's not uh, as you usually do it for your own use and that you're really motivated to, to also tweak the tiny little details because you have the feeling, okay, this is for a huge group of people and this is really making a difference. And yeah. And also, I mean, like media key, media keys that uh, sometimes work or sometimes normally you're just used to, to settling with the stuff that will not work with Linux on your computer. And, uh, it's just normal. But in this case, we really attempt to really make everything work and tweak everything, customize everything and without giving up uh, Manjaro identity. So the plan was to really. Uh, at first glance, you would immediately see, oh, yes, this is a Manjaro environment. But then at the same time, uh, the plan was to make it look differently, uh, also with different uh, features and uh, different applications also, maybe. And, uh, yeah, custom-made for the machine, even down to kernel and to the BIOS and governor settings, schedulers and stuff. Well, first, so we really want to thank you guys stuff. and also Eddie, um, for allowing this to be the platform that you guys announced this. And it, when we were on with just Eddie and he was talking about the Spitfire by itself, he knows I was wiping drool half of the, uh, half of the podcast because it's just such a beautiful looking laptop as is. And then you add my favorite distribution logos and touches on it and the theming. And now I'm just ridiculously anxious to one day get my hands on one of these wait, uh, wait. laptops. They're Ryan's biggest beautiful. question is, yeah. Is yeah. it going to have a green theme? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. DOS Geek channel, my personal channel, everything's green. So I figure, you know, you guys should have a DOS Geek version. <laughs> Especially for you, I put on a green shirt tonight. There you go. <laughs> oh, man. No, but the laptop is just, just aluminum. And uh, also the, the theme uh, is designed to go well with the chassis. But of course, we have the, the typical Manjaro highlight colors, the the typical Maya teal greenish, and of course it's an element. And also the gray, the gray is not bluish gray most of the time, but greenish. That's you know, it's, it's not beautiful a, because the the not a green fire almost has that aluminum unibody like you would get on a MacBook. But of course, it's actually yeah. useful because it has ports and things like that. <laughs> so having <laughs> dongle thing off of it. So I'm one of those people currently that use a MacBook, and of course it only has Linux on it. But I use a MacBook, and there's nothing worse than that Apple logo glowing everywhere, you know, cause you just, I just don't want it there. And I love that you guys uh, front and center is that Manjaro logo on this laptop. So you've got that beautiful aluminum body with that Manjaro logo and it just talks to you. It's gorgeous. Yeah, it's just sad that we were apparently not able to really edge through and have the light through the Manjaro logo. <laughs> yeah. we, well, one day well, we'll, we'll do that with that the DOS Geek version, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, we touched on it last week. It'll be, um, it'll have the flagship XFCE. Is there any plans yep. to, you know, do a KDE version, do a GNOME version? 
Well, it depends how we will uh, finalize the XFCE edition. And sure, we are also thinking about KDE or GNOME edition as well, because if we have one profile finished and the basic settings are always the same, then we can easily adapt that to the other ones. But we decided with Eddie which desktop is most current, which desktop we can use, which we don't have to tweak too much, but have it there. And though we decided to have it on the XFCE cost, it is a slow development, but under the hood, we have a rolling release and having something consistent with a uh, laptop, which is always stylish and uh, have some worth to it if you look at it. XFC was a perfect match for it, yes. But uh, when we grow, when we see how many machines are out there and people might install different uh, desktops as well because we have the variety of those in our uh, distribution, then sure, if we have some requests, yeah, we go also for the KDE version. But our main goal was settle to one, settle to one machine and make it perfect so that it works for the beginning. And if someone tries to install Windows on it, I hear it auto self-destructs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> View immediately. <laughs> it makes boom in two seconds. Yeah, right? <laughs> so the, you said there will be specific drivers and it will be personalized. So let's talk a bit, little bit about the work that went into making it specifically or designing it specifically for the Spitfire, the Manjaro kernels and stuff like that. The fun thing is, I mean, XFCE, right? The, the idea was that we use the desktop we we have uh, already developed uh, very well, and then, uh, but then uh, somehow we decided, okay, it would, it would really be awesome to to uh, have already the GTK three version of XFC. So in fact, we ended up packaging <laughs> all of the XFC packages from Git, and uh, so <laughs> that was a lot more work than we expected but then uh, mostly philip did a lot of also low level tweaking you can tell more about that philip yeah so if you have a machine uh while well, you start something you install something check how the concurrence so the other people will do it how it will smooth out i even installed pop us from uh, system 76 yeah so yeah everything runs or uh, tuxedo linux xfce has started as well so some editions the multimedia keys or uh, some keys didn't work so uh, i was figuring out how that is possible what might be the issue went into some tweaking group settings uh, kernel settings as well and finally made it happen even we have an, a driver there which you can do uh, the flight mode so if you pop that button, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi will go off. If you pop it again, it will automatically start and log in again. So even so, each button is there to work, and it works. Very nice. Awesome. So will this have separate repos than the normal Mandrara repos, or will they be, will it all be the same? No, we have some custom packages, but they go in the regular repositories. And uh, so it just updates with everything else. Theoretically, theoretically, every Manjaro user could install the Spitfire edition also, but of course it doesn't make sense. Right. Could, you know, the driver is there and all the packages. Some just have a different name, like uh, XFC SX setting or something like that. But they are just, uh, there was also... Uh, uh, from the beginning, we knew that th this was important, that we are not going for separate repos and uh, uh, custom Pac-Man settings or whatever. So the idea was absolutely to integrate it completely uh, into Manjaro repositories. So when will the lucky individuals who are in the areas you're shipping to be able to get their hands on this masterpiece here? Really? So, okay. it's uh, What was it? The 13th of October you can pre-order? That's right. Yeah, I think so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and end of October, we will ship the first uh, builds. Don't think so, I didn't think about trying to cheat. I knew those dates and could validate for them. I was like, <laughs> I can make it look like I'm from Germany, have them ship it to a friend, then forward it to me. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you can we visit us and pick it up. Out. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, so pre-order start yeah. October 13th, and then you'll start shipping them at the end of October. 
Yeah, well, well, yes, well of course, correct. the idea is that the machines will not be sitting on the shelf because they're also custom built because you order your your detailed setup. Uh, what uh, what SSD drive size you want to have for which CPU? So I don't know really how how long they take to build your machines, but with if there is a, a huge list of pre-orders, then it will maybe take a little bit longer and be worth the wait. Definitely be worth yeah. to wait. try to be one of the first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we, we try to build them in three to four, up to five days, something like that is the building time, as I knew from Eddie. And okay. since we already started on the 13th and we want to uh, ship it end of the October, some of them should be finalized as well. And yeah, we will meet up uh, for the final product in London as well. So me and Bernard will fly over. And we'll see the first products which are finalized and make some videos, do some demo talks and such. So we always check the product from uh, the beginning to the end. Yeah. So that's how we do uh, quality management as well. It's not just we uh, do the development, we also design the laptop. So we have the possibility to see how the logo should fit, which design should be on the laptop it's itself how the keys should be there. And yeah, we will ship for now only in Europe. So that's uh, how Eddie can ship. But uh, as you can see, we will also do the US market as well. We will see how Europe will uh, start with it and then see the rest of the world. Well, we're going to put as much pressure on Eddie as we possibly can. <laughs> to start <shipping. laughs> so. America first, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, at least start, for crying out loud. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So getting back to Manjaro, according to your wiki, uh, it's based on Arch, but it has its own set of repositories. So having the AUR is like a huge advantage for getting software. But there are also concerns uh, that people bring up about security issues um, and things like that. So what do you tell people that are new, new to Linux when they ask the security question for the Arch user repository? Well, we have, we have a different thing. If you, if you take Arch, they will update all the day. You might get 20 updates, maybe 100 updates. And since they always pump it in, they don't do a quality management as well because as soon as some maintainer releases it or tested it on his machine, it's out there. Since we are now working with the Spitfire and other companies and such uh, for that thing, uh, we have to have in quality management. And we even before we had laptops, uh, we started to think about how we can achieve those. So uh, I do snapshots from the arch into the unstable branch. Based on that, we will check is there something to do? Then our maintainers will package, if needed, our patch, uh, packages against those, push it uh, to testing, and then if uh, the community says it's fine, it will be go to the stable branch. And uh, with the Spitfire, we always test each uh, update beforehand and say, okay, it's green on the Spitfire, and now we can move it. Uh, this is what we will do in future to have a more qualified uh, update recycle as we have now also uh, customers with products. And if we have uh, some issues on the machines, it might make no sense. And for the re uh, security packages, yes, we have the different branches. And for each branch, if it's needed, we will package them separately. So the user has always those. We have a security menu list uh, where you can look up which packages might have issues. And uh, then you can wait uh, one day at least or even less uh, than you find an updated version of that a specific package in all branches. So that's kind of one of the critiques. I'm glad you touched on that, that we've heard, you know, and it's not just with Majoro, but any rolling release. Um, but one of the critiques you hear is, well, if Majoro team holds these packages, then you have to wait two weeks to get a security update. And that's just not the case because you guys prioritize, as I understand it, your security releases first. And then if it's just something like a minor update or tweak to a program, you may hold that uh, a little longer for your quality control, right? Yeah, the thing yeah, is so we can fast forward security updates. We can just push it to, through the branches immediately if needed. 
uh, with all the other packages, of course, we have a lot of also our own packages and it just takes time to, to adjust to, like, for example, if, uh, uh, if I see you or GTK updates, then uh, a huge pile of packages needs to re be rebuilt. And uh, we just try to make sure that nothing slips. So it may take a while until we have checked everything and also until the community has checked it. Of course, it's a little stretch between uh, uh, passing on packages immediately, also with uh, compatibility with AUR packages because they are intended to work with Arch, of course, which is two branches below normally uh, in, in certain cases because normally you build the package against the packages that you have actually on your system so it's, normally it works extremely well. So recently I installed uh, XFCE Mojaro Edition because I, I saw that as the flagship. I'm, I'm a KDE Plasma guy, I just love KDE, but I hadn't spent a lot of time to check out XFCE and I was actually showing my desktop off to Rocco, like, look what you could do in here, all the customization options and things there. But one of the things that when I was sharing my desktop with Rocco is I was looking for Octopi. And because I was used to seeing that in the KDE version, although I had distro hopped in between. And so then I was going back and I couldn't find it there. Is that something that is unique to just KDE or was it removed or am I just really dumb and couldn't find it? <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's uh, the, the package manager goes with the toolkit. So okay. since XFC is GTK, GTK based, uh, it's PAMAC because it's a GTK3 application and Octopi is a QT application, so it goes well with KDE. So the idea is to not need to install too many unneeded dependencies just for the package manager, of course. Gotcha. Well, that makes sense. I wish that was a more complex answer, so I didn't look so bad. <laughs> but you can still install it. Is that complex enough? <laughs> and you can even use it. It should work. <laughs> there you go. All right. So one thing that I have said, not just about Manjaro in the past, but about uh, usually Arch-based, because I'm not usually running an Arch-based system, mainly because of the stability issues and not having the time to work out any issues. So... What I've personally experienced and what people have talked about were uh, rolling releases, Manjaro in specifically seeing how I'm talking to you guys. It works great for a week or two, and then something usually goes wrong on my end. I don't always have the time to work. I know there's a solution to it because uh, all you have to do is take the time to research it and fix it. But where can people go to get help? Uh, for problems like this who are not so familiar with Arch, Arch itself? I would say it makes most sense to install Manjaro together with joining the forum <laughs> because <laughs> the forum is just absolutely, I mean, it's, it's singular. I, have, I don't know what to say even. You feel I mean, home. Uh, <laughs> right. When you have a problem, it, it normally takes about five or ten minutes until you have a competent answer. So you will find solutions for anything there in a very short time around the clock because the people from all around the world are online constantly. And so really, that's uh, uh, it takes maintenance every now and then. And... Uh, I think you should be a member of the forum and then you should you should be fine. <laughs> the community there is very tight in the Manjaro world. And it's, I, it's I know this personally because I never intended to switch to Linux. My channel kind of fell into it. And I, Manjaro, folks from the Manjaro forums and community were spamming like try Manjaro, stop using any other distro you got. <laughs> they were so loyal to it. And when the video came out, it just exploded in popularity because they were so happy that I finally did it. And it's just, <laughs> but it's a very tight knit community and you can find answers very quickly to your issues um, when, when you're having them. One of the things that I'd like to find out from you guys though, is as you guys know this, inside and out better than anybody you probably hear misconceptions even from people who make videos or podcasts or you hear a mention manjaro and you're like eh, that's not really right what are some misconceptions that you guys hear that you want to clear up is there anything out there i don't know i only watch positive reviews 
<laughs> if it's negative, you just turn it off. <laughs> That's all awesome. smart. <laughs> yeah, well, the the slogan that uh, people like to mention in in both directions is the user friendliness. Of uh -huh. course, it is user friendly, and it's uh, a lot easier to use and to to maintain than an Arch install normally, and uh, but it takes some. Uh, uh, I mean, you have to get a little bit into it and you you have to learn some stuff. It's not just, uh, it does not just run on its own and you just press a button and it updates. It's not really like that. We encourage uh, everybody really to use the terminal and to get used to commands. And uh, one day you just realize that uh, actually the GUI is not needed and it's a lot easier without. <laughs> <laughs> and one so day you may even not help out Manjaro. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's the normal. It's the normal development of people. They first they use it, and then they like it, and they they dig into it. They get to know it more, and then they help other people, and then they start contributing. That's the normal procedure. Yeah, it goes That's also one so. secret why it uh, why it grew so quickly because, yeah, it uh, speeds up by itself like that. All right, so you guys offer a huge repository of software. How do you go about picking the default software for the desktop? Well, it was more a process what we started with. We started with one CD edition. So it was always has to been fitting on 700 megabytes. So this was popular or possible with the XFC edition. KDE, it was a lot harder to do so, but we managed in the beginning. But now we are on USB sticks or DVD discs. So we have more space, but we decided to have it under two megabyte, uh, gigabyte, not megabyte, megabyte would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> that would be small. Yeah, Yeah. so t 2G it is. And uh, we see what the community wants. We had some polls uh, where we uh, see what uh, is liked and uh, we even switched it. But with the XFC edition, we settled to a fixed package set. So. The community is happy with it. Uh, we asked them how which packages you might remove when you install Mancharo. And based on that, we changed a little bit. So most of the installations, if you have it, you can simply start. You can use it as an uh, office computer. You can play multimedia. You even can play uh, uh, Steam, some games and such. So it's just a mixture of everybody can use it right away without going into how I want to install packages and such. Wow, right. you actually listen to the community. That is awesome. Because <laughs> that there doesn't always happen. Input, all the time, yes. <laughs> all right, yeah, so we, we have input and then we, we discuss it. And uh, if something gets mentioned five times, then it uh, gets more urgent. <laughs> nice. Now, what happens <laughs> if the community works. really wants something and you're like, no, I hate it? You kind of override them, right? You kind of say no. There's no way that's happening. He's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, like if it's uh, depends on the edition. It's more or less uh, everybody. Ha every edition has, so to say, uh, its father or so. <laughs> Philip is the XFC guy, and uh, Katie also the uh, Kirik uh, is taking care of it, uh, and Stefano is in charge of GNOME, and so the whoever is in charge of an edition more or less makes the final decision, so to say. So, nice. so Philip's the godfather of XFCE, so he can yeah. just say no, it ain't gonna happen. I love it, godfather. <laughs> that's your new title. <laughs> All right. So one thing very unique about Manjaro is the ability to use multiple kernels. So, what does this offer to people to allow them to use multiple kernels, except for them wanting to do it? Does this give them some advantage, or is there downsides oh, yes. to that? I well, don't know the downside because uh, <laughs> whichever kernel is best for you, you will just use it and just don't use a different one. Yeah, Philip, you can tell more about this. Well, based on the kernels, uh, Arch Linux has only two ones, that the cur uh, current ones and uh, the LCS version. And since I'm building all the kernels, uh, I decided at some point, uh, well, we can keep them as long as upstream is maintaining them. So I decided and... Uh, project or way how we can install those in parallel. So I was always with Linux and the version number and then the actual version number in the package. And 
it paid off. Everybody knew about Manchara. Hey, there you have all the kernels. You can even spin your own uh, ISO with a specific kernel if you like to do so, if that is helping you in getting started. And if somebody is asking me, hey, can you spin me that version with a new kernel, then I can say, yes, here it is. Give him a download link and he can start Manchero even if the main kernel version is not used to his new hardware. And even so, if you're starting to use the latest kernel, also the release candidates, you learn about them. What is the issue? You can figure out the problems with the proprietary software beforehand. Even, even uh, somebody in the community consider it to use it. So yes, the latest version I'm running now in a Spitfire is actually in a development version of the next LTS kernel, the 4.14. So that's one of the things I can use the latest, have my extra modules uh, already packed. So, and uh, we created tools uh, like uh, Swiss knives. You can decide, you can remove the kernel, you can install it, you can switch it uh, on the boot. It's a your Manchari operating system and you have the options and you can use all of them. That's the one of yeah. our purpose, even so with our desktops. Well, something yeah, I typically person. use case for okay. different kernel, kernel would also be, for example, I have an, uh, an Acer laptop here and I'm not able to update the, the BIOS because I have no windows on it, which is really annoying. But then uh, <laughs> I can use, uh, with every kernel newer than 4.1, it crashes every half an hour or so. So I can just stay with 4.1 with, for this machine. That's really, that's really great because with most other uh, installs, I would not have this option. So this is really helpful. And uh, if uh, I disappear, sometimes it's maybe because I'm currently using 4.14. <laughs> <laughs> when when we started this, I was uh, just uh, only got aware of this and I thought, oh, I hope this was a good idea. Yep. <laughs> it, seems to work it seems to work fine, Philip. <laughs> I actually, always we're tested good it. now. I We've tested, tested it. it. <laughs> well, one of the things I personally love oh. about Manjaro is the compatibility. When I was using Manjaro for the first time, I put it on the most powerful computer I could afford, a GTX 1080, i7-6700K, 32 gigs of DDR4. Like I just maxed out a system that I could afford. And I really wanted to show people Linux is more than just a tool where you can install something on a slow machine. It's amazing for powerful activities. And I think Manjaro was one of the distributions that showed that off the best. It just really, um, it looks, especially with KDE personally, I just felt it really made everything look and flow um, beautifully together. They were in sync. The compatibility was there immediately. And one of the ways that Manjaro really differentiated itself from other distributions I was using is, for instance, in Ubuntu and others, when I would install them, I wouldn't be able to use my mouse or I'd have black screen issues because I'd have to go and manually use my keyboard because all of a sudden the mouse wouldn't connect to go and choose NVIDIA proprietary drivers to finally get my screens back on and all that stuff. But Manjaro has something called the hardware detection tool that allows it to kind of know that ahead of time. And I had to do none of that when I installed Manjaro as far as playing with those drivers and things. So can you tell us a little bit more about that tool and why you guys developed it, because it seems truly uniquely Manjaro. Yeah, sure. So with that tool, the Manjaro hardware detection tool, you can start to install the kernels and also you will manage all the drivers. So we have some profiles and I was sick of uh, the problem that all the drivers are installed on an ISO and then removed. So I decided, hey, why not uh, create a tool find out which uh, driver is actually needed and install it on the boot up from the first thing. So that's why the Manjaro ISO sometimes take longer to start up. And everybody's wondering why that happened. If you will pop in an Ubuntu, it's there in under 20 seconds, but the Manjaro first startup is always longer. Actually, we install now the specific drivers. And if it starts in the live mode, you can test it out as it would be then installed on your computer. So it's more or less a live demo with uh, the proper uh, hardware kernels and extra modules pre-installed, fitted especially for your computer. So there's some customization done during the startup. And based on that, we have uh, the knowledge and can see, hey, in that specific laptop, it doesn't start. So we have to figure it out and change it in the detection tool. 
So it's thank you for creating that tool. <laughs> it is just so useful. You have no idea um, when you're when you're trying to get something to work and you're not an experienced Linux user, especially when I was first starting out and I didn't really know what I was doing. I was relying on forums and people who are helping, but having things like that taken care of so you can get into the core of things, it just makes life so much simpler than trying to figure out why all of a sudden your mouse doesn't work. <laughs> or yeah, exactly. why your screens are blank, you know. That is our our slogan: key, uh, enjoy the simplicity. Yep, absolutely. All right, so you have a new release, seventeen point oh three. So no four. Seventeen oh four. Seventeen oh four. Yeah. <laughs> Did I yeah, miss one or what? On Friday. <laughs> yeah, you missed it. Oh my god! You need to go do an update. Wait, <laughs> it was it released on Monday, I guess, and uh, now we had to release it because uh, Bernard found some issues in the cinnamon. And we had to release uh, new things, all the cause of crashes in the Calamari's installer. And it was a perfect fit to release or re-release it with a new version last Friday. So, yeah. So, Rocco, <laughs> you're not up to date. Well, I am up to date, actually, <laughs> because I downloaded the new ISO and I installed it. And one of the things that uh, – okay, so – a few months back, I tried to install Manjaro KD. I had installed Manjaro XFCE, and that was fine. But I could not. It took me a month to try to get Manjaro KD installed, only because I didn't have the time to the free time to mess with it. It, it wasn't working right from the start uh, because it wasn't detecting my drivers and everything on my specific machine. So I didn't have the time to find out what was going on with it. This time, I downloaded the ISO. I put it on a USB, I installed it, and it worked perfectly without any issues. So you did you did some updating to Calamari's and the detection tool. So Yes. <laughs> so let's talk about it. What what updates did you do on Calamari's that allows that? Well, the drivers are always with a detection tool, so we get always feedback from the community and we get uh, always the hardware details. So we have also an uh, info version of it where you can type in what is your hardware. If you type in mhwd-lh, uh, it will list your hardware which is installed. And with based on that ID codes, I can create uh, the profiles and update it. And if some people say, hey, in this specific laptop, it doesn't work, I will update uh, the profiles, give them uh, the updated version of the configuration. And if they say yes, then it will be uh, added to the database. So in that case, if a user has a problem, I show him how to detect or tell me which hardware he's using. I can uh, tr even help him without uh, having the hardware on my end. So it's always a win-win nice. situation for that specific user. That's why I need to go to the forum, Rocco. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm going to the forum after this. <laughs> yes. No more, no Rocket League tonight, Ryan. We're going to the forum. You're going to be on the forum. <laughs> hey, we could live stream the forum, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. All right. So with this latest release, you you touched on it earlier that you are not supporting 32-bit uh, computers after this. So. What made you come to that decision? And uh, I know that there's people out there who run 32-bit machines, but it seems like a trend that this is happening, that 32-bit support is starting to die off. Well, one of the main decisions is that uh, Arch Linux we are based from uh, will do the same, also the same time frame. There will be a uh, 32 version of Arch Linux. And uh, based on... Uh, the decision we doing also now hardware, we might not have the needed manpower to maintain a second architecture. So it was one of the saddest decision we had to do. But since there are still distributions out there and we are uh, more than willing to help to adapt our community, which is still using the 32 version um, to a different distro, which might uh, work uh, still for a while, I guess. Uh, we have no problems. And even so, if they keep uh, using our forums and ask uh, standard questions about Linux, we are more than eager to help them. So yes, it is a yeah. sad thing that one architecture will die, but it's also a good thing that we now can concentrate on one specific one and make it even better because we can push all our energy to that specific one. So I also think it's really sad because originally the Manjaro is also something <laughs> that really works well on older hardware and on weaker hardware. 
because it's right because it's so light. But then, uh, yeah, as you say, it's just we we just there would not be a way to do it. It's we would have to maintain all the the 32-bit packages ourselves. And at the moment, we really we benefit a lot from what we get from upstream. We add a lot, but it's still more than enough work yeah. for a few people. We are. So what are some upcoming features or changes that are going to be coming with this? You guys are going to have some more time to focus on the 64-bit version, et cetera. What are some things we can look forward to in Manjar world? Well, what I have accomplished already is integrating Flatpaks. Mm. So Flatpaks is now running out of the play, but uh, Martin from uh, Canonical also asked us to join uh, the Snap front. So yeah, nice. we might have uh, some going on there, even to integrate uh, the store into our graphical packet managers. We will start with Pamek. I already uh, asked uh, Glom what he thinks, and Martin offered us to have uh, some development uh, and enterprise rights to the Snapcraft uh, homepage where the development is there. And if that will uh, pick off then we are good. And yeah, I told him we have to wait a little because now we have the current release, which we might not add snaps to it. But in the uncoming releases, uh, there might be something. That's a big deal. You know, I'm pretty excited yeah. about that. Yeah. And also, I think what, what Guillaume is doing with Pamek uh, altogether is, uh, is also pointing in a very interesting direction. He has started to, there's a, a development uh, version of Pamac already. It's going in the direction a little bit of a software center with uh, packages sorted by categories and with the icons and stuff. So it's really looking very promising. I think he's doing great stuff there. Wow, that would be great because um, you know it's not that you that's not that uh, Pamac is hard to use, but uh, anything that will increase uh, the usability of it is a good thing. So. And also, of course, the, for in, installers, there is always a lot of work uh, with the, the architect. We are about to add more file system support for newer file systems. And uh, there are still also some difficulties with uh, different uh, encryptions, uh, both for Calamaris and also for architect. So there is always a lot of work. Well, since you guys are here and there's nowhere for you to run, two things when I was installing Manjaro <laughs> that, that I would love to see, and maybe it's me not seeing it and it's just not apparent to me because I've only been with Linux for probably, I, I guess, about eight months now. So I'm not a super experienced user. But one of them is during the installer you talked about is the non-free driver, which is what I have to choose each time. But as a new user, when I first was installing Manjaro, I didn't know what that meant. What does non-free driver mean? I do know, know now, but I would love it if there was just a little explanation for new users of what does it mean to choose between free and non-free? What are the advantages? Because I know you guys look at it and you're like, yeah, I know what that means. But for new users, we're like, what does that mean? Do I have to pay for this? Do I click next in a PayPal comes up and wants $21.99 because it's non-free? That, that's kind of what I did. And then the second thing, um, is an option that clearly allows you to tell it where to install the master boot record or grub. Because I noticed on a lot of new uh, installers from other distributions, they'll either ask you at the very end, do you want to install it or not? And that would really help me as a distro hopper and not screw up my system <laughs> if I can choose not to install a master boot record or simply just uh, choose exactly where I want it to install without having to go through the manual partition creation process um, option. So those are my two wish lists <laughs> that I leave you with uh, th there. To Ryan, work on. you know where you need yes. to go. He couldn't run. You go to the to, forums. You need to go to the forums, dude. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, look for my posting on the forums where everyone goes, it's yeah. there, you moron. You just didn't click it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we are going to call it proprietary drivers then. Is that more helpful for you, Ryan? <laughs> uh, yeah. Even just an explanation under it that says proprietary or something would help, definitely. <laughs> All right, so if people want to get involved in Manjaro, um, what's the best way to get started? And you guys offer help as far as, or you have links for PayPal donations. Um, what, what help are you looking for? Well, 
we don't have always to donate. So we have a lot of people who are donating to our project so we can pay off all the servers and such. Mm -hmm. But you can also help with documentation. You can help with user support. So most of the people uh, joining our forums, having fun, enjoying uh, the stay there and they decide, hey, I love this community and I want to do more. Then we have people who join uh, the forums and to be on that they transfer the, the knowledge what they have gained in the forums also to the wiki and write uh, them down so new people can uh, look them up we have uh, teachers who joined our team to do our documentation like the user guide if we ship always a new user guide based on the iso we release which has the standard which will actually explain what is the non-free and the free one so ryan simply <laughs> can read the manual <laughs> just read the manual how dare you yeah but you, uh, uh, this interview is with. over <laughs> that was awesome <laughs> <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, of course, we have uh, people who are developers. Uh, even uh, there's one guy who started up. Hey, I love Manchari so much. I started some uh, WebKit uh, desktop, and I call it Jade. And Jade is ex exclusively developed for Manjaro. We can install it. It's like a dashlet, which you can use, and it's really fast. And we get a lot, a lot updates of it. And in the end, if it's uh, solid, might be have an addition of it. So yeah, it's it's uh, universal we, how we are, also our community is, and yes, you can do a lot. What you want to do with the operating system, how you want to give back, it's up to you. It's a also a great way world. of contributing is, is to use not stable branch, but testing or even unstable. So we have uh, early feedback, especially with more experienced users, that's extremely helpful. And uh, but uh, just recently we, we were saying that it's surprising how how quick the feedback works already. I mean, if sometimes you're not finished with a dependency package and the first one is already uploaded, then you will already see the message: "Oh, it's not working. There's something broken." And that's really real time. <laughs> yeah. but that helps a lot, and also, of course, we often we need translations for be it documentation or also for. Uh, for scripts or installers and uh, also that is, I mean, there's, the, everybody just does what, uh, what, he, what he likes and what he can do best. Also, for example, designing wallpapers, uh, people even uh, contribute icon sets sometimes and all sorts of stuff. Very mm -hmm. nice. So if you want to help out, you can visit www.manjaro.org. Or you can go to the forums. <laughs> or read the manual. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> or read the manual. <laughs> All right. I, I have one treat for you guys now. Um, I can connect uh, with my phone and uh, show you the current prototype I'm using, which we are using now for chatting. Ooh, let's like do it. Is, is, is this for the Spitfire? Because it's just going to make me so sad. <laughs> <laughs> are you sure? I think it is yeah. for the Spitfire, right? Let's oh, wait and man. see. Oh man, let me get a towel for the drool. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and oh, there no. it is. Oh. You need a halo effect going right. on right now. <laughs> so if you can see here, it's really, really slim. Yeah. So I just put it here. So and it has really, ports. Really you don't need dongles. <laughs> it has ports. So even so. And one of the things here is you have a network port here. Yeah, nice. It's a network port. Love and it. And you see it's illuminated and it's all there. And yes, that's uh, how we will have uh, the final product. Who's that good looking guy on your screen? Oh, that's me. Never mind. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a big whoever. shout out to, to Eddie once more. He's such a great guy. And uh, yeah, really. I have never heard someone talking about a computer with all his senses and with so much Passion. love and uh, the way he talks about how a key feels and how the key travels and stuff. And uh, Next time, I think he will talk about the smell of, uh, of his new machine or whatever. <laughs> it's just fantastic. <laughs> Something like that. Yes. Well, Eddie was on last week, and he was an amazing guy to talk to. So uh, much fun. Doing so much He's good work at brilliant. Station X. Yes. So we appreciate everything. Guys, it was awesome to talk to you. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to do it. 
and keep up the great work. Yes. Thanks absolutely. a lot. All Take right. Care, everyone. Bye bye. <laughs> That was such an awesome interview. I really appreciated the fact that Bernhard and Philip met with us and were able to kind of go into some of the detail that I wasn't aware of. I'm a big fan of Manjaro, as you know. I know that you're loving Manjaro right now that you just installed, but kind of getting that behind the scenes look and then really the privilege of having them and Station X using us as a platform. Just incredible. What did you think? Well, look, it's not often that you get to meet and actually talk with people behind the scenes, uh, lead developers, and people that actually spend their time making this. You know, we, we download these ISOs. We're distro hoppers, so we download mm -hmm. ISOs all the time, and we think nothing of it to install a new one. But every single one of those, there was tons and tons of time and effort put in by these guys. So... It's just awesome to get to actually talk to them and appreciate what they do. And what I love, and, and you kind of made mention to this, is just how human they are. Like they, these guys aren't on forums beating people up, beating people down with their superior knowledge of the internals of Manjaro. They want people to use this tool. They want new people. They want experienced users, but they're con except for the manual comment. You know, now that I think about it, take all of that I just said and scratch it. No, that was they were, awesome. They were awesome, but they, they you could truly see that it's a, it's a different type of passion. It's great to be passionate and want to use the right terms or have every infinitesimal detail about how something works down. That's great that you have that. But they don't wield it as a weapon. They wield it as a tool to bring more people in to the Linux world. And I think there's something to learn there from this interview, just watching that, of how cool and laid back they are and uh, just really fun individuals to interview. Well, the last thing is, if you want to help out, go visit the forums. That's all. That's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we want to thank the uh, Patreon supporters again this week Definitely. because uh, the last two weeks we were unable to uh, put the podcast up the, a day earlier, which we normally do for the Patreon supporters. But because of the announcement last week with Eddie and the problems I was having with the Ike interview uh, video rendering, uh, it, they, we were unable to do that. So I thank you for your patience. And if you want to support us, you can go to destinationlinux.org. And the, all of the links are there, including the Telegram group. Ryan, yep. you you are in the Telegram group. What do we talk about in there? Well, we talk wow. about some of us show off our cups. Like, because, you know, you could go to Teespring, too, and get some hot Destination Linux gear. Destination and Linux I, I tried podcast. something really unique. I, I um compared this to my Yeti, and I find this keeps my drinks cooler. Really? Mm -hmm. Well, I know the Absolutely. coffee tastes better. So if you want some, you can go to <laughs> teespring.com forward slash destination Linux podcast and you will find all kinds of stuff you can purchase and support us at the same time. So it's much appreciated. Definitely. All right. So everybody have a great week. And remember, the journey itself is just as important as the destination. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for listening to another episode of Destination Linux Podcast. All right, so let's try that again one more time. <laughs> we have time. <laughs> Are you okay. sure it's recording this time, Rocco? It's recording. Well, like I said, Zoom was recording, but I want OBS to be recording, so. Yeah. We have an outtake now. We start with the outtakes. Is there anything you want to talk about before we go? Yes. I wanted to say that uh, uh, the greatest thing for me about Linux is that it's a bubble of collaboration. And uh, regardless of uh, any political, religious, uh, or whatever uh, boundaries, uh, borders, uh, we in the forum, we just uh, talk uh, to everybody without even knowing where they are from or what, uh, what their belief system or whatever is. And that's just amazing. I mean, this is really the way the whole world should function, I think. 
uh, then also the what impresses me every day is what uh, when the resources of people come together even without any financial interest what groups of people can achieve and how much we can do and how expert and professional stuff can can be when just enough people work together that's really amazing i think that might be one of the best closings <laughs> to a destination podcast episode ever rock <laughs> that was really? awesome yeah. that was absolutely yeah. awesome yeah.